G'day ladies and gentle tubers. The plan here is to create an entertainment unit that surrounds the TV, hides all the nasty cables, and fits in with our mixture of Japanese, industrial, and farmhouse stylings. My timber of choice is cedar. I've used cedar throughout the house, as it goes perfectly with the style of the property, the acacia floorboards I've been using, and it's readily available from my local cedar mill, which is about 10 minutes down the road. It's also kind of fun to work with. I've got a couple of 2 by 10 inch slabs here that I'm going to make the main cabinet with. 10 inches is the perfect depth for my cabinet, so all I'm doing here is cutting for length and height. My mission here is to show you that with simple tools and woodworking techniques you can build a beautiful piece of furniture for low cost and in a limited time. The technique we're going to use here is called a rabbit joint. The joint is achieved by creating a shoulder that is half the thickness of the timber deep and then the full thickness of the timber wide. This will allow you to join a vertical member into the shoulder creating a perfect 90 degree. Now I simply cut the sides to the appropriate height to create my cabinet. Before I go gluing and screwing this thing together, I need to prepare the surface. Using my belt sander with a 36 grit belt, I give it a rough sanding, being sure not to take away too much of the original patina from having the timber rest outside in the weather. I also need to make sure that I have guide pockets cut in to allow for the smooth operation of sliding doors that will go into this cabinet at the end. These guides are cut with a half inch router bit and the top guide needs to be cut at a full inch depth. This extra bit of depth will allow the doors to be installed and removed. I plan on having five individual doors so I need at least two guides for these doors to run in. The bottom guide only requires a half an inch of depth. I've used an aluminium angle and some G clamps to hold everything in place while cutting these guides. I've also added a couple of very small nails to support the aluminium angle and prevent it from flexing as I make the cut. This is an inexpensive way of creating a very good straight edge. Finally I give everything a finishing sand with some 100 grit paper on my random orbital sander, being sure to lightly sand all of the edges as well as the flat surfaces. As a final detail, this cabinet will have an open back and be mounted over power and utility ports so I need to cut a recess to accommodate plugs and cables. Finally it's time to put this thing all together. I would suggest you use a larger flat surface than I am using here, but this space is best for me for lighting so you lot can see what I'm up to. Be sure to apply wood glue to both sides of the area you wish to bond. This will ensure a good strong union. Finally I use a two and a half inch external finishing screw to complete the joint. These screws are great for cedar as they have a very coarse bitey thread and a nice fine head so that they disappear into the grain of the timber. After she's all shut together I go over again with the sander to make sure all of the joins are perfectly leveled. So now she's real pretty, but where the knots are in the timber, there are large holes and we need to finish this off. So I'm going all traditional Japanese with it and I'm going to fill these holes with beeswax. I've used a bit of masking tape over the hole initially and then backed the masking tape with cardboard to stop the masking tape from peeling off once it gets up to temperature. Then using my map gas torch and an old beeswax candle that's already got black dye in it, I melt and fill all the holes. This process requires a little bit of patience as the wax shrinks considerably as it cools. The wax also takes some time to cool 
so it is worth working on a few areas at once. It is a very satisfying process and I much prefer this finish to epoxy resin. Be sure not to burn away the cardboard and masking tape as you go. Finally I go over the whole piece with a beeswax and citronella finish and then once again using my map gas torch blend the two different types of wax together so that I have a uniform finish. To be sure of a perfect finish I go over the area two or three more times to make sure everything is nice and even. The intention with this cabinet is to install it floating off the floor. So I use a couple of furniture dollies and some timbers to level it up and position it to the right height. Then with the aid of a stud finder, I simply screw the cabinet into the wall with four inch screws positioned at 45 degree angles. Due to the height and size of this cabinet, this is plenty of support for this unit. So for the doors, I'm drawing a little bit of inspiration from an 18th century Japanese pine pantry that I bought about 10 years ago in Sydney. It's also finished in black beeswax and has been one of my favourite pieces of furniture since we purchased it. They are a simple structure, basically comprised of a square frame, panelled inserts and battens. The plan here is to cut all of the frame and batten timber to the appropriate size before I start so I can simply manufacture the doors in one quick run. I'm using a mix of cedar offcuts as well as some new cedar to get all the sizes I need. However all of these are stock sizes and easily available. Should you not have a table saw or contractor saw to cut them down to size. I've set up a simple jig on my bench top, sized and nailed into position to ensure the doors are made with equal and even spacing. This also helps me hold the door in place as I drill and dowel 1 8 of an inch dowels to hold this thing all together. This is very simple doweling as I am not trying to dowel into a blind hole. The drill bit simply drills a hole and I fill that hole with a dowel. This is very straightforward and the exposed dowel on the finished product leaves for a nice finish. I then trim the dowels with a Japanese pull saw and sand until I'm satisfied. The door is then rotated and the same process is continued on the other side. It's then simply a matter of cutting the panelling to size and gluing and nailing it into position. I found some really nice little copper plated 3 quarter inch nails that do a beautiful job and really look the part. To allow these doors to travel in the track made in the cabinet I use my router and a straight edge to create a half inch slot in the bottom of the door. Take your time with this because the router can bite and create a big mess of your finished product. This very nearly happened to me even with years of experience. There are definitely some new tools I would like to get to help me create content for the channel. To create the top edge of the mechanism, you're required to make a cutout that is one and a half inches deep. This is to allow the door to be lifted up and onto the bottom rail. It's easily achieved by cutting the notch with a reciprocating saw. 
the wood panelling is already the right depth for the guide in the cabinet, but needs a good sand down as well as a lead in edge created to give the door enough clearance to be fitted within the channels and slide freely. I then give everything a quick rub down with some 200 grit sandpaper to get rid of excess glue and any sharp edges. The doors then get a good thick coat of citronella and beeswax and I add the occasional bit of heat to dissolve the beeswax that has collected in the corners. Now with the cabinet all but completed I'm on to making the main support posts which should have just been a case of cutting some 4x4 inch posts to size. However I've had to settle for cutting this beautiful 10 by 35 inch slab down the middle to make two posts. Again this was old timber that was extremely well weathered so I simply needed to give it a rough sand before it was finished and ready for waxing. The cut side was flame treated along with the shelves as I had to make the shelves out of very new timber which unfortunately didn't have the patina that I usually desire. So to flame treat this I give it a good even burning with my map gas torch and then using a rotary wire brush I remove all the charcoal to expose the wood grain and darken the growth rings. As you can see with this close up it leaves a much more vivid contrast between the growth rings of the timber. It also leaves a much more pronounced texture of raised ridges along the growth lines. Each shelf consists of a pair, with one half of the shelf going on each side of the post. To achieve this I have to cut a recess on each shelf to accommodate the post. For best results here I clamp the paired shelf together and cut singularly. This will help with alignment later on. I make a few extra cuts within the required notch to allow the excess material to be easily chiseled out. This is especially handy when working with material with lots of knots within it. Again, all the shelves get a good rub down with citronella and beeswax. Waxing all of these parts before they're assembled in place reduces the chance of you putting wax all over your newly painted walls. Now to the dowels that run within the posts to hold the shelves up. I've used one and an eighth of an inch dowel here and cut them down to one inch narrower than the finished shelf size. I then add a small chamfer with my bench grinder to make them easier to install and flame treat them as I have done with all of the other timbers. And finally, we're onto the rest of the installation. As you can see, I've tidied up all the wires to my router and other bits and pieces using zip ties and making cables that are specific to the length that is required. I also have feed through outlets behind the TV and behind the cabinet so that cables can be routed directly behind the wall and leave a nice clean finish. Now I simply slide the doors into their railing system and the cabinetry part is complete. She's turned out just the way I wanted with the sharp contrast between the colour of the door and the darkness of the rest of the cabinet. Now on to posts and shelves. I'm doing this one on the left hand side first as it's only got one shelf and will warm me up for the other side which is going to require a lot more levelling. I use my laser level to help align the shelf and to ensure I drill the hole straight as I pass through this post. 
I use my spirit level to make sure that the post is straight and that the end resulting shelf is also straight. You can see here as I drill the first hole for the posts on the right hand side that I keep the laser line down the centre of the casing of the drill to make sure I drill the hole for the dowel perfectly straight. I then drive the dowel in and start setting all of the shelves on top of their dowels but at this point only the shelves that will be behind the post. The key point here is that I have used a level of some description in every step here to make sure that I have no out of square posts and shelves at the end of the job. Finally for the long shelves I want these to appear to be floating but still have very good strength so I use a piece of half inch pipe as dowel and drill it through the shelf and into the stud behind the wall. I leave a couple of inches protruding from the rear half of the shelf to fit within the front half of the shelf. This is the most inexpensive way to get a good strong floating shelf. The rest of the shelves are then anchored into place using 3 inch external finishing screws. These screws are inserted from under the shelf at a 45 degree angle and through the plasterboard into the stud frame behind and she's all done. As always I've left a good list of all of the tools and products I've used below and if you've got any questions please fire away in the comment section. Let me know if you've enjoyed this one by hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. Thanks again.